in mind, I want to talk about what happened over this weekend. Over this weekend, we went through a transition. We left the month of Nisan and we entered the month of Iyar. Um, actually, last night in our building minion, we have a little minion downstairs. It's like the craziest thing. We all look like um, something out of Purim. We're wearing these masks and we're keeping the social distance. But we all had the same thoughts last night when Marv was over. Why didn't the Geula come in the month of Nisan? And it's such a perfect time, Hashem. You couldn't have done a better job than to bring the Geula in the month of Nisan. So I mentioned that I can give you reasons why you can come in the month of Iyar. The month of Iyar, as we all know, Iyar stands for Ani Hashem Rofecha. I am the God that brings you healing. And with what's going on in the world today, it's a perfect time for the healing to come to its full conclusion with the coming of Mashiach. If it doesn't work this month, next month is Mount and Terror. What a perfect time for Mashiach to come. Bottom line, Hashem, if you're listening, bring it on, okay? We're all ready for Mashiach. But the point is, is that this transition from Nisan to Iyar in the world of Hashkafa in Jewish thought is very dramatic. Because Nisan is basically the month of the Lamb where Hashem does everything for us. Hashem basically says, We say to God, we're the sheep, we are Mazel Tleh, we are Aries the Lamb, we will follow you. Hashem says, I will take you out of Egypt, I will show you miracles, I will take care of you, I will do everything for you. And then suddenly, boom, we're thrown into the month of Ia, symbolized by Taurus the ox. And the ox is no longer taken care of by a shepherd. The ox has to find his own inner strength. The ox is on his own. The ox feels lonely. And the ox has to find that special strength as we will speak out over the next couple of minutes. So I want to ask you all a question. You're all learned. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you a simple question. What month in the Jewish calendar has a Hebrew name that actually appears in the Chumash? Not just a Persian name like Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Av, but a Hebrew name. So if you can't type it into the chat in the next 10 seconds, I'm going to have to tell you the answer is, is that Nisan is called in Parsha's bow, the month of Aviv, Aviv, Aleph, Beis, Yud, Beis. And this Tvatara that I'm going to give you now, the first time I said it, was in honor of the birth of my daughter Aviva. Aviva, Baruch Hashem, is now a mommy. But when Aviva was born, she was born on Rosh Chodesh Aviv, on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. That's why we named her Aviva. And it occurred to me, let me talk a little bit about the uniqueness of the month of Nisan through the lenses of the name Aviv. So why is the month of Nisan called Aviv? I'm going to make this question even stronger. The Ramban, at the very beginning of the 13th chapter of Bo, tells us the following. He says, Perak Yud Gimel, the 13th chapter of the book of Exodus, is a list of all kinds of mitzvos that are foundation mitzvos that are connected to not just the coming out of Egypt, but to the foundation of the Jewish people as a nation. And there, the Ramban says something very beautiful. So just, I just want to add at this point now, my Rebbe, Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, he used to love to show us mitzvos that people are not aware of. We all know that there are 16, 613 mitzvos, correct? 613 mitzvahs? Wrong, wrong. There's at least a thousand mitzvahs. There's 613 mitzvahs the way the Rambam counts it. There's 613 the way that Rapsadi Gon counts it, and so on and so forth. The Rambam has a bunch of mitzvahs that no one else has. Here's an example. He says, and I quote, right in front of me, I have the quote of the Rambam, Perak Yud Gimel, Pasuk Beis. He says, there's all kinds of new mitzvahs in this parak. The Pasuk says, today you are leaving in the month of Aviv. That's not just facts. It's a mitzvah. Remember, we came out in the month called Aviv. 
So the Ramban says, it's a special mitzvah to remember that we came out in the month of Aviv. What is so special about the fact that we came out in the month called Aviv? So the simple answer is the words of Rashi. Rashi, it could be, a lot of you remember this, from when you used to learn Rashi on the Parsha, and you came to this very special, beautiful Rashi, where Rashi says, remember we came out in Aviv, because Aviv literally means the springtime. And here I'm going to read to you the words of Rashi. Rashi says, Hashem did such kindness, he took us out in a month, which is a beautiful weather. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's not too rainy. The bottom line is, then he brings a pasuk, and the bottom line is, is that Hashem took us out of Egypt in a perfect, beautiful month. So what's the mitzvah? The mitzvah is, hakaras hatov, to appreciate the little teeny weeny things that Hashem does for us that we tend to forget. But here, when we came out of Egypt, it is particularly poignant, it's particularly powerful. And I'll tell you why. It's 1945, it's Bergen-Belsen, it's a concentration camp. The American troops come and liberate. At that moment then, for people that had gone through all six years of hell, the last thing on their mind was the weather. All they could think about was freedom. Who cares what the weather was at that point? And the answer is, if Hashem is teaching us that throughout the 210 years, I had to go hidden, but you should know how much I love you. At that moment of reconnection, the smallest little detail matters. When someone wants to show their love, it's not enough just to bring flowers. You gotta bring the flowers that your beloved enjoys the most. You have to have the arrangement, the way she likes it. Every teeny day detail shows how much you care. Hashem, the simple answer, by bringing us out where the weather is perfect is that when I'm allowed to reveal myself, I need to remind you that the smallest little detail matters to me because that's how much I love you. So the bottom line is, the first and simple and most basic answer to the question, why do we need to remember, according to the Rambam, that we came out in springtime and that is called a mitzvah, is Hakar Sato to appreciate how Hashem takes care of the smallest little details. That's the first answer. Rabbeinu Bachya, the great student of the Ramban from Barcelona. Rabbeinu Bachya gives two more reasons why the word Aviv is special. And the second one that he says, I'm gonna say very quickly, but the first one is what I wanna talk about tonight. Actually, I say tonight, and if you can see, it's, uh, it's getting dark outside here in Yerushalayim. But uh, for you, I think it's 10 o'clock in the morning. At this point now, it's already 10.30. The bottom line is, Rabbeinu Bachir says that Aviv is short for two words. Aviv is Av Yud Beis. Av, the father, Yud Beis, the 12 months. Meaning, the, Rab the Rabbeinu Bachir says, remember we came out in not just a regular month, but rather the father, the foundation blocks of the 12 months. And here we'll have to have another class, another day to explain the importance of understanding why we had to come in the first of the 12 months. But now I can finally get to where I wanna to get to. I wanna to talk to you about the first explanation of the Rabbeinu Bachya. Why is it important to remember that we came out in a month called Aviv. What I'm gonna share with you now is not just a Chodesh Aviv, Chodesh Nisan, Sfiris Oma class, but rather it is a message for how we are supposed to live our lives. It is intrinsic, it is powerful, it is something that we need to keep in our minds from morning to night. What does Rabbeinu Bachir say? And I wanna to quote to you his exact words. Rabbeinu Bachir says, and I quote, 
We came out in the month of Aviv. Shuhuzman Katsir Sairim. It is the time of the barley harvest. Shahayakana Bishiboles Shinikra Aviv. When the barley is in its stalks in the correct form, it is called Aviv. Milashon Av. Kiuhamoilid Gargir Hachita. And then he brings a pasuk, which is a pasuk at the end of Parshas Be'era, that reminds us that the word se'era, which is barley, is connected to the word aviv, as the pasuk says, v'hapishta v'ha'se'era nukaisa, ki ha'se'era aviv v'hapishta giv'o, which means that the word aviv, which literally means full stalks, so when the stalk is at its zenith, is a reference in the Chumash over here to the barley harvest. At this point now, I'm going to give my feeble attempt at a drum roll, because the bottom line is, the Rebbeinu Bachi says, remember, we came out in the month of Aviv. You know why? Because it is the barley harvest, and you must remember that we came out during the barley harvest. Okay, I can't see your faces, except for one or two. I'm sure that you are like overwhelmed with excitement. This is so important to know. Oh my gosh, we came out in the barley harvest. This has to be a mitzvah in the Torah, one of the 613 mitzvahs of the Rambam. This is so exciting. But the truth of the matter is, um, even though you guys are in Missouri, so there's probably barley harvest going on there right as we speak could be in your backyards. I grew up in a big city. You guys are just like, whatever, okay? Just a couple of hours away from you. You're in Kansas. And there you can see the barley in its full stalks. And remember, we came out during the barley harvest. And if you think that Rabbeinu Bachia does not know what he's talking about, go and check out his own Rebbe, the Ramban. The Ramban in Parshas Emma. On that pasuk that talks about Sphiris Omer. He says, everyone knows there's a mitzvah called Sphiris Omer. Sphiris Omer is a mitzvah to count from when to when. From when to when. So if any of you wants to type in, in your little chat from when to when, you should be writing from Pesach. Hold on, I'm going to enable chat. Let's enable chat over here. There we go. From Pesach. To Shvurus, right? We count from Pesach to Shvurus. That's what Sphiris Oma is. Wrong. It's not what the Ramban says. The Ramban says the mitzvah is to count from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest. There we go. Go Shifra. Once a student, always a student. Okay, <laughs> there we go. I taught you about 200 years ago. I think somewhere between the Civil War in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. But there we go. The bottom line is, is that the Ramban himself says, you're supposed to count from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest. So not only is it a mitzvah to remember we came out during the barley harvest, it is a mitzvah as well to count from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest. What is going on behind the scenes over here? Just want to share you. Uh, this idea that I'm about to explain to you, I heard this first from my Rebbe of Moshe Shapiro, and when he said it, he used Talmudic language. He says, whenever the Gemara wants to talk about things that don't connect, they always talk about barley and wheat. Now, you guys are Americans. If I know correctly, you like to talk about apples and oranges. In England, where I come from, I don't know if anyone knows I'm a Brit, but we used to say chalk and cheese as an example of two things that do not connect. In the Talmud, they use barley and wheat. If I come up to you and I say, you owe me money, and you say I owe you half of what you said, that is considered, I agree with what you're saying, but I'm changing the terms. But if I say to you, you owe me wheat, and you say, no, I owe you barley, says the Gemara, that's not anything that connects at all that is completely disconnected. Barley and wheat are two opposites. So the words to count from barley, to count to wheat is intrinsically a paradox. 
it is intrinsically something that cannot happen. You cannot count from barley to wheat in exactly the same way that I cannot count from chalk to cheese and you cannot count from apples to oranges. But now I'm going to show you something extraordinary. And basically we need to go and learn a little bit about the nature of the barley carbon called the Omer. Now Omer, O-M-E-R, I in Memresh, was something that was brought the day after Seder night, on the second day of Pesach. It came from barley. So I want to share with you a Mishnah. It's at the beginning of the second parak of Sota. And there the Mishnah says the following thing. You should know that what's called a Mincha, a Mincha is a grain-based offering. So we just read it in Shabbos a few weeks ago that there's a type of carbon called a mincha that comes from grains. All grain-based carbonos come from wheat. Why? So the simple thing that we always like to say, wheat is the food of kings. Barley is the food of animals. You have to give food that is exalted from wheat. By the way, this is completely in square brackets, but my Rebbe, Ramon Shapiro, would also say, today there's a thing called health food fad. He said, if you notice that health food fad is that we today are eating what uh, 200 years ago was called animal food. So I don't want to say this too loud because my wife, she's not going to get, she, you know, she makes the, the best spelt challah, no offense. But uh, if you want to know what spelt challah is all about, I personally won't touch this stuff. I eat her chocolate chip challah, but spelt challah is something that she loves. But I'm not going to lie to you. Yes, I will have oatmeal for breakfast. I'm middle eight. It's what we do. We eat animal foods. That's it. The generations have gone down, says my Rebbe. But once upon a time, everything was wheat. There are two exceptions. There are two things that come from barley. One is the barley carbon called the Omer, the Omer, which is bought on the 16th of Nisan. And the second one, anyone you want to type out the answer? is called the Minchas Sota, okay? There is a type of woman called a Sota woman. The Sota woman, which is unfortunately a woman who has been accused of being untrustworthy to her husband. So the Sota woman is brought to the Beis HaMikdash and she has to go through a whole process. One of the things that she does is she brings a carbon called the Minchas Chaita or the Minchas Saita, and it comes from barley. So we have two types of carbonos, two sacrifices from barley. One is the Minchas Aimer, two is the Minchas Saita, says the mission in Saita, but they're very different. Because the Saita brings unrefined pieces of barley, they are not processed at all. Actually, the Mishnah says, you don't bring those two ingredients that makes things beautiful. One is called levina. When I was a kid, in English, levina is, is frankincense. I always thought that frankincense was like a monster. <laughs> I couldn't understand why you were bringing a monster. But the bottom line is, is that frankincense is something that gives fragrance. And levina is the Hebrew word for that. Levina is one of the words for the imahos for the matriarchs. This woman did not behave like the Imahos. The other ingredient is called Shemen. Shemen is oil, oil creates light, and she acted in darkness. This woman has to bring this unprocessed barley. She is lowly like the animal kingdom. Comes along the Mishnah and says, but the Aymer is different. The Aymer is passed through 13 sieves. So you go to Beit HaMikdash, and the Beit HaMikdash, they had these sieves uh, that are very, very, have big holes in them, and you put the barley in, and it goes through, and the one underneath has smaller holes, and the one underneath has even smaller holes, and it goes on. 13 levels of sieves, sieves or sifters, whatever you want to call them, Napa in Hebrew. Each one is more refined than the next. The number 13 is always a symbol of completion. Yud Gimel, like Shlosh Yisrei is the is the final number. The word Echad 
is Gematria Aleph Ches Dalet 13. 13 is always completion. The maximum that you can refine barley is 13 times. I'm just giving you a quote from the Mincha Shlomo. The Mincha Shlomo, by the way, was a, is a commentary on the Mishnah that was beloved by the Chida. The Chida speaks about this, was an old Sephardic master of Shlomo Adani. And he writes that the idea of 13 is to try and get as close as possible to the quality called wheat. Me'ain kemachitim, we're trying to get to. But it never works. It never, ever works. You can never actually reach the world of wheat. All you can do is refine the barley to the best of your ability. Okay. Now, some of you are thinking to yourselves, that Rabbi Nissel, no offense, but this is way too technical for me. This is not actually so interesting. But I'm warning you now, the next 20 minutes of this class is going to blow your brains apart. I don't mean to be graphic because it's almost bordering on spiritual violence. But I'm going to share with you something so beautiful and so powerful. But let me just summarize what I've said so far so that we are all on the same page. What do we learn? There's a mitzvah that the Ramban brings down to remember we came out in the month called Aviv. Says Rabbi Nebachia, Aviv means the barley harvest. What does the barley harvest remind us of? Remind us of? The carbon oimer. That is what it reminds us. The Ar omer, which is brought on the 16th of Nisan, of the 16th in the month of Aviv. Now, what is unique about the carbon oimer is that it is refined 13 levels to the best of your ability, you want to turn it into wheat, but you can never turn it into wheat. All you can do is do your best. You refine it and you refine it and you refine it and then you get to the 13th level and say, Hashem, take this from me. And then on the 50th day, the day when Spiris HaOmer is over, then you bring a carbon called the Shtei HaLechem, which comes from wheat, that's on Shuas. That's at Matan Torah. That's the 50th level. That is the level beyond this world. That's the spiritual world called Matan Torah. So what's going on with refining barley? The answer is everything is going on. Allow me to explain. Let's go back over 3,000 years. And let's go back into the Midbar, into the wilderness, and join Moshe, and Aaron and Miriam, let's be part of Kleisville in the Midbar. I want you to picture a fictitious couple um, who would like to give me the names of a nice Jewish boy married to a nice Jewish girl. Where are you, Shifra? Help me out over here. I want to have a Jewish boy's name and a Jewish girl's name, whatever works for you. Okay. Yanki and Chani. There we go. Yanki and Chani. Yanki and Chani are the ultimate power couple living in the Midbar in the times when the Jewish people were going through the wilderness and they loved every single moment. They get up in the morning, everything's done for them. They don't have to worry about a thing. There's a measure that says that the cloud would come through their tent and give everyone that freshly showered feeling that 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 the 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 their clothing would have this sort of gun aiden fragrance it would be freshly laundered they would get up the mon would be ready the mon tasted like the garden of eden the mon in the ramban's words was basically the food of angels it was the shina itself in physical form whatever that means and after a good breakfast on the mom, what do they do? They do what they love most. They went to Torah classes. That was it. They were the rah-rah students. And they would run off, and Yanki would go and hear a shift from Aaron Cohen, and Khani would run off to hear a shift from Miriam. And this is what happened throughout the day. They loved learning Torah. They just couldn't have enough. And at the end of the day, Moshe Rabbeinu would give them like a Musar Shmuz. 
and he would say to them the following. He says, remember, my dear Klai Yisrael, it's not about the Midbar. It's not about the wilderness. It's about, and at that point then, the curtains would open up and a gospel band would suddenly appear out of nowhere and they would all start singing, take me to the promised land, ooh, 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 yeah. Take me to the promised land, ooh, 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 yeah. This is, this is my feeble attempt. And having lived in Memphis for two years, um, I always wanted to be a gospel singer, a Jewish version. So in my imagination, that's it. Moshe Rabbeinu had these singers come out and they would tell everyone, it's about Eretz Yisrael. It's not about the Midbar. It's about going to the Holy Land. Okay. The 40 years are over. They say goodbye to Moshe Rabbeinu. He goes up to Shemayim. But don't worry. They're in good hands. They have Yoshua. They cross over the Jordan. For seven years, they're fighting the battles. For another seven years, they're dividing the land until 14 years have gone. And finally, life is good. And they're settled in the Galilee. Yeshua gives them a little homestead overlooking the Canara. It's beautiful. There's two dogs in the yard. And that's it. And it's just, everything is just like a dream. And they wake up the first morning there. And Hani turns to Yankee. And Yankee says, listen, okay, um, I know you want to go and learn now. But, but, uh, but this is it. Moshe Rebbe says, you got to work the land. So, so he says, yeah, I know. I've got some seed money from Yeshua, I'm going to the village, I'm gonna meet my friends, I'm gonna get some, um, some, some seed, and I'm gonna get like myself a plow and an ox. And he goes there, and there's his friend Shmueli, and you know, Shmueli gives him, sells him all the stuff that he needs, and says, oh, by the way, I just wanna warn you, you know you're gonna need fertilizer. It's a little nasty, but it's not gonna go without fertilizer. He goes and he starts working. 16 hours later, in the boiling hot sun, working the land, putting out that fertilizer. He finally makes a home to Chani. He walks in. She says, what's that smell? He says, leave me alone. I've had a long day. He says, no, you go straight and take a shower. Showers have not been invented yet. Okay, I'll go to the nearest river. Okay, he comes back. He smells a little bit better. He walks in. And Chani looks at him and says, my dear beloved husband, you're not an earner. You're a learner earner. That's it. That is, that's what we signed up for. Go to the cola and start learning. And he says, are you kidding me? And he stands there in front of that wall, that blank wall. And he says, give me the remote. And she screams at him, idiot. He says, TVs have not been invented yet. You're going to have to wait another 3,000 years for that. Just stare at the wall. And then she starts complaining. To him, you think you have a hard look at me? You know what I did for you today? I have nothing in this place. There's no electricity yet. There's no running water. I've got to go to the well. Do you know what I have to go through to make food? Everything has to be from scratch over here. And where are you, Linda? Complaining about technology. If I want to talk to my sister, I've got to walk five miles. I'm completely on my own. You think it's easy? This is a permanent quarantine. I'm going out of my mind. And this goes in day in, day out. And they don't like this because they are in a constant state of exhaustion. And they think to themselves, well, guess what? Soon we're going to go to your Shalai Merakadosh because Yom Tov is coming up. And we are going to give Yeshua a piece of our mind. Okay. They go to your Shalai Merakadosh, Aliyah Laregal. They come there. There's a big sign, the complaint sections. It's like half a mile long. A lot of angry young couples. They make it to Yeshua. They walk in. Yeshua has, you know, gives them a big smile. Ah, Yanki, Hani, how you doing? It's so nice to see you. And then he looks at their eyes and says, "Okay, guys, you guys don't look very happy. Let me guess. Let me guess. You don't like this new arrangement. You want to go back into the wilderness. You want to go back to where the good days with Moshe Rabbeinu and Miriam and Aaron and the mom and the Anan HaKovet when everything was perfect. And they go, yeah, that's what we want. At that point, Yeshua looks at them and says, don't you remember the teachings of our master, Moshe Rabbeinu? At that point, then he goes like this. 
and the curtain split, and out come the gospel singers, take me to the promised land, ooh, 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 yeah, take me to the promised land. He says, it's all about Eretz Yisrael. Hashem does not want us to live in this little bubble. And I always say this as a farewell speech to my seminary students in Yeshiva Bachrim. This is perfect, but it's not what Hashem wants. Hashem wants you to go out. And he wants you to go into that world. And you know what he wants you to do. I'll tell you exactly what he wants you to do. But listen very carefully. He wants you to go into the world of barley. And he wants you to pass the barley through sieves. Another sieve. Another sieve. Another sieve. That is all a Jew is supposed to do in this world. Pass barley through sieves. So they look at Yeshua and says, we don't know what you're talking about. He says, let's talk about how you start your day. It's very, very simple. First thing in the morning, you get up. Everyone has to go to the bathroom. Animals have to go to the bathroom. So what's the big deal? But that's not what you do. You go to the bathroom. You come out. You say Ashiyatza. You know what Ashiyatza is? It's passing the lowliest animal experience through a sieve and raising it. You don't just put on your clothing. You make a bracha, mal bisharumim. You make a bracha on your shoes, shasuni kaltarki. You put a bracha on your belt, ozi sabik vura. Then you go to breakfast. You don't just eat like an animal. You take everything and you say, my gosh, look at this bread. Look how beautiful it is. Let me make a bracha hamaitzi. Let me thank Hashem Atu with benching. And then you start. It's just the first few minutes of your day. You're passing everything through sieves, every physical thing that you do. And then you go to work. You have the whole of Chesh and Mishpah, all the laws of the workplace. Every single moment a Jew can take the physical world called the world of barley and pass it through a sieve. How many times? 13 times. In the language of Spiritus Oma, 49 levels. Every single day, another sieve, another sieve. In other words, the, the marshal to the marshal, the metaphor to the metaphor, is that the 49 steps of Sphiris Omer is exactly parallel to the 13 sieves to refine that which we called the Omer, the barley, the animal food. We try and refine it to the best that we can. But we can never ever reach the 50th level. We can only reach the 49th level. That's all we can do. All we can do is go into the physical world and do the best we can. Like Linda's father. Linda's father, he sees a person that doesn't have clothing. He doesn't just say, you know, write a check or talk about things or learn the Torah of Chesed. He goes and does, he gives him a suit. It's a person who lived taking the physical world and elevating it to something higher. Linda's father was an inspiration for all of us to remind ourselves that we need to look around. And again, I don't want to give you Musar because you guys are wonderful people, but those of you that at the moment that we speak have things relatively easy in your situation. The moment this class is over, do something in memory of Linda's father, I'll give you the exact name, Yosef David ben Avram, go through your phone list and look for people that need a little bit of a positive message, a little bit of help, a little bit of love, a, a virtual hug through this technology that Linda so hates. Go out and do something out there. Take a piece of barley and pass it through a sieve. And now I want to get to my main point. All we can do is our best. All we can do, as the Malach Shlomo says, is try and imitate the world of wheat. But from 49 to 50, there's an infinite gap because wheat and barley do not connect. Says Hashem, if you do your best and try and climb from 1 to 49 or 1 to 13 using the metaphor of barley and of, of barley in the in the base of Mikdash. If you do your best, then in the end, I will give you the 50th level as a gift, which means every single person that you know, that you admire, 
at some point Hashem has smiled at them and given them some kind of a magical gift that cannot be explained logically, that brings them over into the 50th level. Every time you say, oh, that, that, that woman, she's a tzedekas. You know what she did? She did her best. But that little fairy dust that goes around it, that's the gift from Hashem that took her from 49 to 50. That's the Matan Torah. That's the level that we can't do logically because barley and wheat do not connect. It's the gift that we get from a Kurdish Baruch Hu. So what is our take-home message over here? I want you to all to think. Hashem put us through the craziest of craziest of times. And yes, He gave us the gift of technology. Two, three years ago, none of us had heard of Zoom. It was the Rufua before the Mako. Hashem allows us to do chesed and to learn Torah and to give people a smile and care about people like Linda's father used to do, even when we're completely quarantined on our own. Even when we're sitting in our virtual little homestead in the gallery with nothing, we can go out and we can try and reach out and try and make an impact. During the years, the days of Sphira, remember we came out in the barley harvest as the Ramban. Remember that our job is to embrace the physical world, embrace the challenges of Mother Earth, and pass it through sieves. Every physical hardship is an opportunity to pass that through the lenses of halacha and the lenses of Jewish loving kindness to try and reach something higher. And then, if you've done all that you can do, which is your best, Hashem takes care of the rest. Hashem will transfer you over from the 49th level to the level of the 50th. So I want to give you all a bracha. I have one advantage over all of you. I'm in Yerushalayim, Er HaKodesh. And as the sun is setting in beautiful Jerusalem, and our little mask minion of Mincha is going to be in a few minutes, all I have left to do is give you all a bracha. We shall all be zocher to continue legacy like the people that Linda's father represented, the legacy of chesed, of Torah, of tefillah, of all we can do, especially during this time of the year, looking at physical challenges and saying, how can I pass it through a sieve? And Hashem should reward you with the bracha of all brachos, that everything should be able to be passed from that 49th level to the 50th into the world of wheat, the world of kings and queens and princes and princesses on this spiritual level of closeness to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And with this, what we're going through now, as it ends, it should end all the tsars of the physical world. And if you be zeichet to greet the Melech HaMashiach, who will teach us how every single physical challenge is nothing more than a portal to closeness to an ever-loving HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when we all be zeichet to experience this in Her of Yameinu. Thank you so much for the honor and the covet of teaching you. Hashem should give you bracha v'atzlacha in every single direction. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Rabbi, and thank you to everybody for participating. And I sure would love to make this a once a year event. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully next time in person. Right. Thanks so much, Rabbi. All the best. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody from Tzfat. Miss you.